Most of you work within a small to medium enterprise or will be founding one of your own small to medium enterprises. So what I'd like to cover are some of the key success factors for your companies and why all of the key success factors involve an understanding and implementation of entrepreneurship. So there's a number of global trends that are important and I'll talk about some of these global trends, how they affect companies, and why entrepreneurship is the answer to this. So a small to medium enterprise, an SME, is defined as a company with fewer than 500 employees. This is almost everybody in, in Europe. 99% of European companies are small to medium enterprises. And 99% of those have less than 250 employees. 93% have fewer than 10 employees. But most of these small, small companies are what are sometimes called micro-enterprises. Most of these were, will never grow. So among these are restaurants, haircutting salons, lifestyle companies, retail stores. So 94 3% of the SMEs are pretty small, less than 10, and will probably never grow. However, 4% are what are called gazella or gazelles. Um, these are the companies that grow by more than 20% a year. And it's been estimated that almost all new jobs in an economy come from these gazelles. Now that's kind of hard to believe that in some countries, 100% of all new jobs come from 4% of the companies that are growing at this kind of a rate. Um, and these studies vary from, from country to country, but it's pretty commonly acknowledged that somewhere between 70 and 100% of all new jobs in an economy come from only 4% of these companies. So really the talk of this, the, the focus of this particular um, discussion is on these small to medium enterprise gazelles or um, gazelle of Deutsch. So, um, you know, there's a lot of problems with the global financial industry right now and there's been a real financial crisis and there's, you might have heard of Basel III, which is a, a new set of financial regulations governing the large business, uh, the large banks. Basically, this is going to further restrict financing available to small and medium com companies. And the gazelles in particular will be most affected by this tightening of credit or reduction in available money. Loans will be harder to get. Lines of credit will be harder to get. Bonds will be harder to get. Inventory financing, equipment financing, all of this will be harder to get. Uh, and it will also increase the negative impacts of a number of other global trends that I'm going to be talking about. So one is that it will increase the impact of what we call the funding gap. Now, when you're starting up a new company, it's very well known that there's this gap or there's this disparity between the money available in the very early stages for research and the money available for a larger company such as venture capital. Now, what this image here on your screen shows is that the government puts a lot of money into fundamental research and industry puts a lot of money into fundamental research and applied research, but very little money is available to start up a new company or to develop and prove the technology and create a commercially viable application. So there's friends and family or there's the entrepreneur's personal money, but there's very little money available in the early birth stages of a new company or a new division. Once you've got a, a product built, you've got a prototype built, you've generated some traction, things are going well, maybe you're earning a few hundred thousand dollars a year, now people like you, now people will talk to you, now angel investors is shown on the screen and venture capitalists will give you money. But no one's going to give you money if you're not already making money. And you certainly can't go to the banks. I mean, the banks are way on the right hand side of this. Um, I mean, the joke they tell about the banks is a bank is like somebody with an umbrella. They'll give you an umbrella when it's sunny day, but as soon as it starts to rain, they take the umbrella away. So the bankers love you when you have money, but as soon as you don't have any money, they're not going to give you money. They make money off of you. They, they make money off of people who have money. They don't make money off of giving money away. They make money off of people who have money. 
So um, it's hard to get money if you don't have money. And it's hard to get money from venture capital or angels unless your company is already up and running and established and growing and making revenues of some sort. So this is a real problem. Now governments recognized this problem for a long time and what this next graph shows here is, is, is how this situation looks from the government's point of view. That the government puts a lot of money into basic research and laboratory prototypes, uh, industry puts money in later on, but there's this fun funding gap in this middle stage, stage right here. Uh, if you look at this from the entrepreneur's point of view, there's lots of people who might loan you $1,000 or might give you $1,000. There's friends, there's family, there's your own $1,000, there's your girlfriend's uh, uh, parents, there's your boyfriend's parents. Um, there's lots of those people. But, um, you know, if you start, you know, if you're looking for $20,000, uh, there's not as many friends and family who want to give you $20,000. But there's angels that might give you... 200,000 or 150,000 or there's government grants that will give you maybe a uh, hundred or two hundred thousand um, But then you know if you're looking for two million dollars, there's not a lot of people that will give you two million dollars So, you know, um, this is a problem that I uh, Experienced when I was starting up one of my companies that we were able to raise investments in the two hundred thousand dollar range but at a certain point in time, we needed more money. And we could raise, I think we did five or six rounds of financing at two to three hundred thousand dollars. But what we really needed was two to three million dollars. And there weren't as many people in that range. So if you need ten million dollars, there's lots of investors available. But if you need two million dollars, there's not as many people. Or, and that's what, this, that's what this figure here shows, is that there's a series of funding gaps at different stages. So on top of this, there's going, to, there's going to be a further decline in the available venture capital financing. Um, there's not that much money available anyway compared to the, the late 1990s and around the year 2000. Uh, and this has been a, a problem that's been happening over the last, uh, the last 15 years. But uh, what this figure here shows is that the amount of capital really, really plummeted after 2000 went almost completely away in 2002, started to come back again, but then after the financial crisis of 2008, it went down. This problem is good. This is going to go down again even more with Basel III and with um, the, the European debt crisis and with the government austerity programs. The amount of VC funding is going down. It's not very high anyway, but it's going down even more as this graph shows. Um, but in addition, the number of active venture capital funds themselves has continued to decline. And because the number of funds with money is going down, they're going to start to consolidate. And so what this means is that increasingly, if you want money, you're going to have to go to a place that has money, like Silicon Valley, New York, Boston. And uh, so, for example, in, in, in Canada, a real problem is that Canadian companies can't really grow in Canada. They have to move to Silicon Valley. And what we've discovered is that the probability of failure, if you're not physically located in Silicon Valley, is almost 50% greater than being lo located anywhere else on the planet. Now think about that for a second. If, it, if you have a 50% greater chance of failure if you're not located in Silicon Valley, why wouldn't you move to Silicon Valley? That's where the action is. Now, a lot of governments and people seem to have a real problem with this. Oh, we don't want to lose our wonderful German companies. We don't want to lose our wonderful Canadian companies. I say, go to where the action is. If Silicon Valley is where the fish are, go where the fish are. You know, don't fish where you want to fish. Fish where the fish are biting. So if there's people in Silicon Valley with money, move to Silicon Valley. Um, Germany will still be here when you've made your fortune, you've become a great, wonderful, successful entrepreneur. Um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful part of the world to live in. Go gain some experience, then come back where, where you grew up at. And uh, I say the same thing to Canadian entrepreneurs as well, too. 
you know, leave Canada, go to Silicon Valley, make your money, or New York or Boston, go where the action is, and then come back afterwards. And we're seeing that a lot in Canada as well, too. We're seeing these entrepreneurs that are back for the second or the third time, and they're now financing and funding and becoming angel investors in Canada, which is great because then when the, invest, when the investors and the entrepreneurs need the big money, they've got contacts in Silicon Valley where the money is. So um, the number of active venture capital funds is going down. It's going to continue to go down. And that means that you may have to pick up and move to where the action is. And that's okay. It's not the end of the world. So what does this mean? Well, because there's less money available for small companies, you have to learn to do more with less. And this is a key entrepreneurial skill. It's called bootstrapping. So uh, you can go online, type in the word bootstrapping. What is bootstrapping? How do I do it? This is a key entrepreneurial success skill. You need to learn how to go with nothing but your own mind, nothing but your own idea, and find a way to prove traction more quickly with less money. You need to not say, oh, I need a million dollars to create this wonderful product. You have to say, how much money do I need to create the minimum viable product that will prove that this is a good idea? Because right now, with just an idea, the valuation of my company sucks. No one's going to give me $10 million for just an idea. And I can't get the $10 million that I need to get to build the amazing, wonderful product that you have in your head. So what do you do? You have to find a way to get from where you currently are, where your valuation might be, I don't know, 200,000 euros if you're lucky and say okay if I can raise 20,000 euros on my 2 million value or my, on my 200,000 valuation what, what can I do with 20,000 euros that gets me to the next valuation point that I can raise more money because if all you got is an idea no one's going to think that your idea is worth 10 million dollars if you're lucky they might think it's worth a couple hundred thousand euros and that's only because they think you're worth a couple hundred thousand euros. So you have to be able to prove traction more quickly, prove your business model, prove your scalability, and, and use the key entrepreneurial skill of bootstrapping. Now this is true not only for entrepreneurs, but this is true for intrapreneurs as well. That your company that you work in, they might not say, oh wow, that's a wonderful idea, here's two million dollars. They might say, hmm, Maybe that's a good idea. Why don't you get started on it and see how far you get with a little bit of money? And so this is, as an intrapreneur, doing this inside the company as well as if you're an entrepreneur doing it outside of the company. The nice thing about doing it inside of a company is you generally have a job, which is nice. <laughs> you don't have to mortgage your house over this. And there, you generally have access to more resources within a company. Um, so those are two key, key skills. So the one key skill is bootstrapping. Another key thing is that because money is so short and money will continue to be tight, that you can use funding as a strategic weapon. That basically if you can raise more money than everybody else, that usually means you can hire better people, you can fly to meet your customers, you can afford to go to more trade shows, you can afford to build a better product, you can afford to build a better product faster, and if you've got enough money, if any of your competitors start to get big enough, you can just buy them up. And isn't that great? Somebody else starts doing something a little better than you, you can just buy them up because you've got more money. So again, access to money can be a strategic weapon as well too. And that's one of the big reasons why Silicon Valley has come to be such a dominant player in the entrepreneurial scene, because they have access to money and they understand and it's really deep in their DNA that they understand you have to move quickly and that you can use that money as a strategic asset. So whereas most parts of the world starve their entrepreneurs and give them less money than they need, in Silicon Valley, and again, New York, Boston are better at this, um, they give them the money they need and they often give them more money than they need because they want them to use that money as a strategic weapon and not waste their time running around trying to look for where their next five dollars is going to come from. So the second thing that this does is because there's so little money available, 
there will be increased in stress. There'll be increased stress not only on the entrepreneurs, but there'll also be increased stress on the investors. So we'll have less patient capital that the investors won't want to sit around and wait for you to spend seven to ten years to grow your business and get a liquidity event. So there'll be increased pressure for a quick exit strategy or a quick liquidity event or a quick sale of some sort. Trouble is, of course, the IPO, the initial public offering market, is so weak that your most likely exit event will be through becoming acquired. And in fact, you're 10 to 20 times more likely to get a liquidity event through selling your company than you will through an IPO, which that means, you know, 10 to 20 times more likely means that 90 to 95 percent of all exits are due to an acquisition rather than going through the public markets like an IPO. I'll show you some data on this. So basically, venture backed IPOs are going down. That's the bar graph there. Um, you know, they had their big heyday in 2000 totally devastated for a while, bounced back for a while, it's back down again. Uh, the few IPOs that they do have are very high value IPOs, crazy valuations like Facebook. But you can see there's maybe 20 to 50 venture-backed IPOs a year. In contrast, if we look at the number of mergers and acquisition deals, there's something closer to 500 M&A deals a year. So if we go back, there's only maybe, maybe 50 IPOs, and there'll be less than that in the future. So let's say 20 IPOs, that's the left-hand part of your graph. On the venture-backed M&As, there's over 500. But this isn't just any merger and acquisition. These are the publicly reported M&As with a value of more than $66 million. So that's why your average acquisition value is so high. The average acquisition value is between $100 and $150 million. So, but that's only because nobody reports anything. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. People don't have to report anything under 66 million. So, um, in addition to the fact that a large publicly reported valuation of more than 66 million M&A is so much more likely, there's also this new thing that's happened. It's called the rise of the quick flip. Because there's an increased pressure to be acquired, there's also an increased rise in pressure to sell at a price point of about five million dollars or really it's between about five and twenty million dollars that big companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, RIM, uh, I think I mentioned Google, um, these companies have a huge amount of money on their balance sheets. Investors are screaming at them to give their money back. In fact, we just saw the other day, Apple is going to have the largest bond issue in history. They're going to issue $17 billion in bonds that they don't need. They're going to basically take on $17 billion in debt just so they can give $17 billion in cash back to their investors. That's crazy to take on debt just because they've got so much cash on their books. So investors are screaming at them, spend your money, spend your money, spend your money. But doing $100 million valuation acquisitions is a lot of work. It's a lot of time and effort. They just can't spend their money fast enough. So what they're doing is in addition to buying up companies at this greater than $66 million valuation, they're buying hundreds and hundreds of companies a year at a valuation point at between five and 10 or maybe as high as 20 million. So let's say five to $20 million valuation. And so um, think about this. The, the people doing the acquiring, let's say Google, they're doing five to 10 acquisitions a week. They're buying five to 10 new companies a week, like popcorn, at this little valuations of five to $20 million. And so what that means is if you're starting up a new company, very often what you want to do is take one to two years to grow fast enough to be acquired at that five to twenty million dollar valuation. And if you don't get acquired in those one to two years, kill the company, quit, give up, move on, start a new one. So we're starting to see droves of companies that start up with the idea from day one, I'm not going to make a million, I'm not going to make a hundred million dollars on this company. I'm not going to grow this company and do it for the next 50 years. I'm not going to retire from this company. I want to start this company, take on as little money as I need, grow it to become big enough to get the attention of one of the big players, and then get acquired at that five to $20 million valuation in approximately one to three years. So, 
Here's the key entrepreneurial skill that you need to do this. One is you have to learn how to fit into the ecosystem of the acquiring partner. So Google's not going to acquire you if you don't fit into their system. So you got to pick which partner you're going to get acquired by and start developing the social network and the social capital to get bought by that company right from the first day. When you're first designing your product, when you're first picking your customers, you also have to have in mind what the final liquidity event is going to be. And you're trying to get from A to B within that time frame to get acquired at that price point. The other thing, though, is these companies aren't just buying you because you're worth five to twenty million dollars. They're buying you because they're buying talent. They're buying you because of the people you've got. And there's been a lot of data on this, and there's been a lot of you know go go to Google and watch uh, um, uh, Eric Schmidt uh, talking about why Google buys up so many people. Uh, they're buying small ten-person teams for talent, so they're buying human capital. And what they're saying is the value of your company might be worth $20 million. And that's entirely the intangible asset value of your human capital. Because very often they buy your company and the first thing they do is they kill the company. They just flush it down the toilet. They don't actually care about your company. They want to hire you. And so this is kind of almost like a signing bonus, if you will. Sometimes they want to keep the company, they want to keep the product, they want to keep the technology, but sometimes they just want you and the people. And so, um, this is a, a big key entrepreneurial skill is the ability to find and retain great human capital and the ability to develop the social capital necessary to have the connections with the partner that's going to acquire you. Okay, so here's a few more global trends affecting small to medium enterprises and there's uh, seven of them here I've got a couple slides on each of these seven so the first one is the increased pace of change so what this graph here shows is call it dollars of revenue or call it scale or call it number of users or call it size of the company or whatever but scale versus time and the way a product life cycle used to work was, for example, let's take a Hewlett Packard printer. That um, the life cycle of, of a Hewlett Packard printer might be two to three years. You design a new product, you do some customer testing, you make a, a prototype of it, you send it over to engineering, they figure out how to manufacture it cheaply, you send it over to the, to, the, to the manufacturing arm, they start to manufacture these things, they work out the kinks in how to manufacture these things, then you sell it maybe to your top retail partners, and then maybe you sell it US-wide, and then maybe you sell it North American-wide, and then maybe you sell it European-wide. And then maybe, you know, after nobody's interested in you anymore, you sell it to the Chinese or the Africans or some other geographical location maybe you don't care as much about. But over the course of a couple of years, you get this first graph that you see here where it slowly grows and then it slowly dies off over a number of years. And, uh, you know, that was a nice calm pace of technological change. But what we've seen is product life cycles are being compressed. And now HP doesn't just release in the U.S. first, they release simultaneously worldwide, all on the same day. And um, they don't just release a new uh, printer after the last one has lived its life, they're cannibalizing their own products. That they release one product, and within two or three months, they're releasing a new product that's already better than the old product that they just released. So what we're starting to see, unfortunately, is more of a throwaway society that because product life cycles are so short that for example the HP printer I bought the other day it's a printer it's a fax machine it's a scanner it's a copier it's it's color and it's uh, 79 euros but once I've used up all the ink it's 69 euros to buy more ink for it so I mean, to some extent, uh, you know, you buy a printer, you use up the ink in it, and then you throw the printer away. Now, I mean, this is an ecological disaster, obviously, but the, but the, but the product life cycles are becoming so compressed that the entrepreneurial skill is you have to be able to adapt and learn quickly. That before you've even finished releasing 
one product, you already have to be designing and building the next product that's going to replace it. We did a really interesting, it's called Demo Camp. We get uh, 500 entrepreneurs in a room, a big auditorium. We did this at Ryerson University fairly recently. We did a big demo camp for Facebook entrepreneurs where this really illustrated how fast uh, life cycles are being compressed for Facebook apps. That we basically had somewhere between 10 and 15 entrepreneurs that got up and all their stories were basically the same. They went something like this. Six weeks ago, I came up with an idea for a new Facebook app. We took two weeks to build it. We then released it, and within two weeks, we grew from zero users to 20 million users. We then made a lot of money off of these people for two weeks. Uh, we uh, know what our numbers are. We really calculated our viral coefficient. We know how quickly people spread this. We uh, very closely determined what our monetization coefficient is. We know that for each user how much money we make off of them. We know what our cost of customer acquisition is. And um, basically we grew from zero to 20 million users over two weeks. We made approximately $150,000 over the course of the next two weeks. And then after that, a competitor stepped in, stole all our ideas, and within two weeks after that, the company or the, the product was basically dead. So the entire product life cycle, from the idea of the app to the death of the app, was about eight weeks. And so you could say, oh my God, this is a terrible thing. But what they say instead is, we learn so much from each, each release that we'll release our product It'll grow from, so maybe the next entrepreneur would stand up and say, uh, it took us three weeks to build our product. We released it, and over the course of three weeks, we discovered that our uh, velocity of coefficient was not very good. Our monetization coefficient wasn't very good. We had a little bump. Uh, we only grew to 8 million users. We only made $20,000. And so here's what we did to fix it. And, they'll, and they'd show the product, and they'd show the user interface experience. They'd show, here's how we treat Here's how we tweaked the, um, the viral coefficient. Here's how we made it easier for our customers to share with their friends. Here's the little element in the game that we used that to, to, to link it to your friend's account a little bit easier. Here's where we moved some of the buying things to be able to increase the monetization coefficient a little bit. And now, boom, let's look at how our numbers changed. It took us two weeks to do the next version of the product new viral coefficient, new monetization coefficient. Wow, instead of growing from one to uh, eight million in three weeks, it grew from one to 30 million in two weeks. But again, like everything in Facebook, somebody else came along, stole our ideas, copied the idea, boom, within two weeks after that, product life cycle was dead. So it was really fascinating that in one room with 500 entrepreneurs, we got to see 10 to 12 different entrepreneurs tell their stories of how they adapted how they learned quickly, and how fast their product life cycles were. And uh, they weren't afraid to show their ideas in front of the other entrepreneurs because they said, hey, we assume everyone's gonna steal our ideas. We wanna steal our own ideas and cannibalize our own product fast enough before anybody else does. And so they have the idea that they'll be releasing a new product approximately every couple of weeks, if not once a month. Because even if you make only a hundred thousand or two or three hundred thousand off of one product, if you've got a new product every month, that's not a bad amount of money. Not to mention the fact that you're now becoming important enough to get the attention of Facebook and hit that evaluation price point. So again, the key success skill, the key entrepreneurial skill is the ability to adapt, the ability to learn, the ability to make mistakes, the, the ability to get something out there and the ability to learn from your mistakes. I like to say that stability for a small company is like stability on a motorcycle. That on a motorcycle, you know, motorcycle is a big, heavy piece of equipment. And imagine you're pushing this motorcycle up a small hill. It's hard to push this motorcycle up a hill. Every little bump in the road, ugh, it's so hard to get this motorcycle up over this little bump. You know, every little competitor or every little obstacle on the road, oh, I gotta move this big heavy bike around this thing. Everything is hard on a motorcycle when you're going slowly. Trying to turn a corner slowly, the bike falls over and now you can't pick it back up again. 
But now imagine you're going down the Autobahn and you're going 160 kilometers an hour. Suddenly, a little bump in the road, boom! You fly right over it and don't even notice it. A competitor jumps out in front of you, you're around that competitor so fast, you didn't even see the competitor. Or some other competitor jumps on the road in front of you, run right over them! Hedges, small animals, doesn't matter. When you're going fast enough on that motorcycle, you're God on wheels. You can run over any competitor, you can outrun your competitors, you can out avoid your competitors. Ten competitors jump in front, whew, I'm in a different county before they even know where the, that the game has been moved. Again, speed is your friend. When my last company, we were releasing a new product as fast as almost every day. We would release version 1.0.2, then 1.0.3, 1.0.4, 1.0.5, 1.1, 1.1.1, 1.1.1.1, .1, almost every day. Sometimes we were releasing two or three times a day. That's how fast we were able to get new tweaks, fix bugs, new features, and customers just loved it. Okay, next thing. So, next big trend in consumer behaviors is the loss of the mid-market or the value segment. This can also be referred to as customers either trading down to buy low-cost products or trading out to buy a product that's just perfect for them. So, um, what we're starting to see is a real trend, is even high income earners shop at Walmart. Why? Because if it's something you don't care deeply about, you want to get a good deal on it. You don't want to overpay for something that you don't care about. So, for a lot of um, goods, people will just buy whatever's the cheapest. And if it's something that's important though, they'll spend anything on it, but they want to buy just the perfect thing just for them. Take my jacket I'm wearing, for example. Um, I care about my jackets. I don't have very many. I might have two jackets. I haven't worn a jacket in weeks. I wore a jacket just for this video shoot. I hope you like it. But when I do buy a jacket, I want a jacket that fits. I want a jacket that's custom tailored to me. I want a jacket that shows off that I'm a successful entrepreneur, I'm a successful venture capitalist, and if I'm going to wear a jacket, it's a good jacket that is appropriate to my style and image. So I don't go to Walmart to buy my jacket, I don't go to Moore's, and I don't go to some middle average kind of a store to buy my jacket. I go to one of the best places in town, and I spend... Well, I go to Harry Rosen, to be quite honest, and uh, Harry Rosen, I'll spend $1,000 to $1,500 on a really good, well-made, brand name uh, jacket from Hugo Boss or something like that. So, um, this is true of most people, that what we're seeing is that average companies are really getting squeezed. That people either go to the low-cost companies, or they go to a company that is tailor-made, customized to exactly what they want. And what, they're, what we've referred to it is, is, you know, so like Prada and Gucci and the crazy expensive brands, they're all doing well. Uh, Walmart, Amazon, a lot of the less, ex less expensive brands, they're all doing very well. Those middle ones are starting to really get hammered. So in Canada, the classic example would be a company like uh, The Bay or Sears or a lot of those kind of stores, their, their values are getting hammered, they're going bankrupt, they're going out of business. Big giants like Eaton have gone out of business. We're losing that middle market. What this means in terms of the um, generic strategies of Porter is that middle value segment that he has. He's got you know, a, a box with four corners. Basically everybody in the middle is getting slaughtered and, and, and losing out. That The center uh, value segment is disappearing. So, um, customers will spend money on long tail services and products and high end products and services that really matter to them. So, uh, the key entrepreneurial skill is diversification, or sorry, differentiation. You have to increase differentiation. You have to be different from other people. And there's a variety of ways to do this through creativity, through innovation, through innovations to your business model. But this is a key entrepreneurial skill. You can't just be like everybody else. You can't say, well, 
you know, I'm going to be a little bit like them and a little bit like them and a little bit like them. All those kinds of people are getting slaughtered out there. You have to be different. This is the key element of strategy. This is the key element of strategy that is talked about in any strategy course. But this is also a key element of, of strategy for using IT and the internet to achieve differentiation. So uh, you have to be creative and innovative and using different business models. Those are key entrepreneurial skills to achieve this differentiation. So similar thing is unfortunately that um, you know, yes, a lot of people are trading down to buy low cost stuff, but most small to medium companies can't play that game. That it's very hard to compete on price. Really, it's the multinational giants that are going to dominate this space. So people like Walmart and Amazon are going to completely dominate this space. And um, they're spending big bucks on their, um, on their value chain activities. They're spending big bucks on supply chain management. And so if you don't find a way to fit into their value chains, um, you're dead. And if you try to just compete on price, you just can't do it. So what that means is you have to only be able to focus on what you're good at, you have to really focus on your core competencies. You have to really focus on your human capital. Again, these are key entrepreneurial skills. As we can see in this particular figure here, um, three of the five Porter generic strategies are essentially not open to entrepreneurs. You can't really get into the overall low-cost provider strategy unless you're a multinational company or you hope to be. You can't really get into the focused low-cost strategy because... Well, competing on the basis of low cost is hard. Now, you notice this little X I made here doesn't quite go all the way down to the bottom of the screen. That's just because, you know, I'm a professor, or I have to be precise. You know, you can still compete in small local areas. So, for example, if you've got a local barber shop, or you've got a local food store, or maybe a local restaurant, or something like that, geographically, you can still compete on the basis of price. But um, for most companies and for most um, gazelles, certainly, you're not going to be able to compete on the basis of, 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 uh, of low price. Um, you know, you're really focused on, 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 on differentiation or focused on a specific market segment. And of course, as I said, because people are either trading down or trading out, the best cost provider strategy is essentially dead for entrepreneurs and small to medium companies as well, too. So basically, strategy is about differentiation and focus on a specific uh, target market sector. Next big global trend, increasingly customers have access to information. But you know, this, is, this is not necessarily a good thing. We're overwhelmed by too much information. There's so many advertisements out there that we find people are starting to, they're starting to, um, they're starting to cancel their Facebook accounts. They're starting to uh, not pay attention to advertising. You know, people are just overwhelmed by too much information. And traditional advertising is really starting to weaken. You have to fight to be heard through all the noise. And so if anybody's going to hear you at all, like you got to be loud enough to be heard. And the way to be loud is to be important. You have to find a way to be important to people. Vision, mission, triple bottom line, character, integrity, all of these things are, are characteristics of the entrepreneur and the entrepreneurial vision and mission that you have to find a way to matter. People don't care about average companies. They don't care about boring visions and missions. Um, you know, there's a great, um, uh, here's, here's an assignment for you. Go to the Dilbert website and create a vision and mission for your company and give it a couple of keywords. And it'll give you the Dilbert uh, vision and mission, which will say stupid things like, our goal is to enhance shareholder value by exceeding customer expectations and delivering just-in-time, high-performance, total quality added, blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. Nobody can read that. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. You have to find a way to be important to people so that they will pay attention to you. You have to be important to people. And this is really the value of a vision and mission statement. And your vision and mission statement has to be unique to you. So, for example, if you can change, 
if you can basically apply your vision and mission statement to McDonald's, it's a lousy vision and mission statement. And you know, there's hundreds of, of companies out there that have a mission statement that's so boring and so generic that you can say, like this vision and mission statement applies to not only you, but McDonald's or you know, pick any one of 30 other companies. If your vision and mission statement applies to 20 other different companies, it's a lousy vision and mission statement. It has to be important to you. It has to get you up in the morning. It has to give you a reason to mortgage your house. It has to give you a reason to spend time working on your company rather than spending time with your husband or wife. You have to be important. At the same time that customers have access to too much information, basically anybody can learn anything about anyone. And so any kind of problem or lie or scandal will be noticed. And so if something goes wrong, you have to act quickly and with integrity. So basically, you know, if, if something goes wrong, people will find out. We're calling this the age of transparency. Or as um, Tapscott and Tiskell wrote in their book, The Naked Corporation, if you have to be naked, you better be buff. That if you have to have no clothes on, people have to like what they see. Because eventually, everybody will see everything that they want to see about your company. You can't hide anything. And so entrepreneurs, the key entrepreneurial skill is you have to be able to infuse your personal character, your ethics, your beliefs into the company that you are creating. You have to find a way to have ethics, your personal ethics, be part of your corporation ethics. Another important global trend is the increase in social consciousness of your consumers. That increasingly people want more than just an economic transaction with the companies they do business with. And we call this the triple bottom line or people profit planet or corporate social responsibility. There's a lot of names for this. That in addition to having a product or service at the right price point, they want to also know that you're doing something that's important. And so um, what a lot of companies do is they basically they outsource their triple bottom line. They say things like, well, if we make enough money, we'll spend some of that money on planting trees, or we'll spend some of that money on buying, I don't know, carbon offsets, or we'll spend some of that money giving money to charity. And um, yeah, maybe that makes you feel better, and maybe that makes some people feel better. But that's not using the triple bottom line as a source of sustainable competitive advantage. That's basically reducing your profits to make yourself feel better. Um, and you know, there's a case to be made to say, you know, who are you to decide what to spend the company's money on? That if the company has excess profits, you should give those profits back to your shareholders, and then your shareholders can buy carbon offsets, or your shareholders can plant some trees, or your shareholders can donate the money to their charity rather than whatever your charity is. So maybe your charity is, I don't know, breast cancer. Well, maybe some of your customers care about breast cancer, but maybe some of your other customers care about prostate cancer. So, you know, a lot of this triple bottom line strategies that companies use are really ineffective. They're just kind of wasting money on talking about triple bottom line, but they're not using this as a source of sustainable competitive advantage. But if you can find a way to build your CSR or your corporate uh, social responsibility into your, the DNA of your company, then that can give you a source of sustainable competitive advantage. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a company called Icebreaker, and they make uh, shirts. Uh, but when I buy my shirt from Icebreaker, from Icebreaker, I know the name of the sheep that was sheared for the uh, merino wool that my shirt was made out of. And I can learn the life story of my sheep. I know what kind of food my sheep eats. I know that it's environmentally sound. I know the home in New Zealand where this sheep grows up. I learn the story about how merino wool is technologically superior to other types of wool. I learn about things like the life habits and, and the, the free range uh, living of my sheep 
whose name is Agnes, by the way, uh, that, that her lifestyle leads to a better type of wool that gives me a better, warmer, more comfortable, high-tech uh, product from Icebreaker. And so this is a company that found a way to tie their social and economic and, and, and um, uh, ecological uh, sound policies into a customer experience that I have a relationship with, my, with Agnes, my sheep, and I have a better, deeper understanding of the icebreaker um, technology uh, that results in superior profit margins for them as well as their triple bottom line. And so, um, again, this is the, the entrepreneurial skill is not just infusing your character and ethics into your company, but also using creativity and innovation as a way to achieve differentiation and strategic advantage. Brands are becoming more important. And, um, you know, I know a lot of us are sick of brands, but uh, the facts are brands work. Brands still command a significant added margin. Good brands, lousy brands don't do anything for you. Um, and uh, you know, entrepreneurs though don't have the money to be able to just spend buying advertisements all the time. And so you have to find a way to build your brand using the key skills of bootstrapping and uh, guerrilla marketing and things like that. So again, you, your brand has to stand for something. You have to be important, you have to be different, and you have to have integrity. So brands are an important global trend. They'll continue to be a global trend, and you have to continue to use entrepreneurial skills to build that brand. Unless, of course, you happen to have a few hundred million dollars kicking around, and you can afford to just beat people over the head with more and more advertising, like some companies do. So um, I won't name any particular companies, but a lot of companies that have money can just buy their brand through money. Um, most small to medium enterprises can't do that, and so they need entrepreneurial skills to be able to build that brand without access to the cash. So the final big trend to talk about is the importance of work-life balance. And this relates to the importance of human capital. That, you know, big companies can afford to just pay people more and more money. Entrepreneurs can't do that. Um, small to medium enterprises can rarely do that. And you have to ask yourself, why do you deserve to have great employees? Because you need great employees. Great employees have options. And they're going to work with you because you deserve to be worked with because they have choices they can leave. So obviously you have to share the wealth, uh, options, stock ownership, things like that. Uh, you have to be important to your employees as well as yourself. But sometimes you have to make difficult lifestyle decisions to understand the kind of time and effort that you expect out of your employees and the time and effort that you expect out of yourself. And so you, the entrepreneur, has to have work-life balance. Um, your employees have to have work-life balance as well, too. And so um, you have to find a way to achieve that happiness on a personal level as well as in the business level. And so there's a lot of really innovative ways that employers differentiate themselves from other employers, whether it's um, casual days at the office, whether it's giving your employees the ability to work on projects that they're interested and excited in, whether it's allowing them to have their dogs at the office, uh, whether it's uh, having them, uh, giving them the ability to have their children at work or a daycare center or something like that. There's a lot of innovative ways that entrepreneurs are finding to enable their employees to have that work-life balance. And so that's an important trend you have to be aware of and be able to uh, adapt to. So, in summary, all the key success skills so, in summary, all the key success skills are entrepreneurial skills. Bootstrapping, how to deal with limited resources. Social capital, how to make personal connections, whether it's to money or to accessing great employees. How to find that connection into somebody who's going to acquire your company. Human capital, having the ability to find, retain, and inspire great employees, managers, and par partners. Being able to adapt to learn, to change quickly, the ability to make mistakes, learn from your mistakes, 
and change quickly. The ability to be innovative. The ability to be different. The ability to be creative. The ability to be important. The ability to inspire and motivate yourself, employees, customers, and partners. And again, the ability to infuse your personal character and integrity into the corporate culture of the businesses that you're creating. So all of the key skills are entrepreneurship skills. The founder of a company or the founder of a new product line, you're, you breathe your life into this new creation that you, you instill when you give this new life into your new baby. You're giving it your vision, your mission, your character, your integrity, your virtues, your ability to manage money, your trustworthiness. And you have to find a way for these personal attributes to extend into the company culture and extend into the lives of your customers, your partners, your suppliers, and to be important in their lives as well. Ultimately, entrepreneurship is fundamental to the human spirit. It's fundamentally that spark about, about what, what sets us apart from the animals. It's that fundamental spark that led human beings to leave the caves, to control water, to irrigate crops, the ability to foresee a more positive future, to plan for the future, and to build better buildings and to devote time today to build those better buildings so that tomorrow, uh, when it's cold, we'll be able to sleep in a warm place in the wintertime. The ability to not just focus on the near-term quarter, but to build a better future. It's about seeing the world not as it is, but as it can or ought to be. The ability to not just see what all your competitors are doing, but to find a different way, to think and act in a different way that enables you to create sustainable competitive, um, sustainable competitive advantage over, over other people. And it's about this link between the personal and the business. And so one of the things that excites me the most about the MBA in this course is, again, I've, you've heard me say this before, entrepreneurship is like playing the guitar. You got to get out there and play the guitar. You don't learn how to be an entrepreneur by listening to me talk about it. You don't learn how to be an entrepreneur by reading a book about it. You learn how to be an entrepreneur by being an entrepreneur. You don't learn how to play the guitar without playing the guitar. So get out there and play the guitar. Get out there and act like an entrepreneur. Get out there and feel the difference between being an employee and taking ownership of the things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Take ownership of your own capacity to change, to, to transform from the person that you used to be into the person that you're going to grow to become. So in the words of the uh, great philosopher Yoda, try not, do or do not, there is no try. Get out there, make some mistakes, Fail. Fail a lot. Failure is good. Fail, learn, adapt, change. Get out there. Have a song in your heart. Get out there and play that guitar. Build some calluses. Don't. Don't. <laughs> oh, well, that's the end. <laughs>